Praise God forever. Praise your holy name, Lord. Please, guys, take a seat. Uh, I wonder how many of you had the same reaction yesterday when you saw the uh, situation that happened in Israel. Uh, it's, it sucked the wind out of my lungs. Anyone else felt that way just watching the footage? It's one of the things I like about Telegram is that it's unfiltered news. Team, you're released. Thank you so much. Could we put our hands together for this wonderful <laughs> worship team? Literally, as I was sitting in my bed praying yesterday and just looking through, and one of the th reasons that I like Telegram is that there's a lot of unfiltered, uncensored news. And uh, just flicking through my Telegram feed at the just the unbelievable sights of the attack. This is really Israel's 9-11. It's very, very uh, similar in spirit and uh, also the, I, I don't know what sort of intelligence failing there was, uh, but that kind of failure at an intelligence level exacts a heavy price on the people. And so it's, it's, uh, it's very devastating, very upsetting what happened. Uh, some of the footage, because it's raw, unfiltered and uncensored, was pretty harrowing. Uh, the news that the people of Gaza were selling body parts uh, as trophies. And one of the highest prices that was being paid was soldiers' eyeballs uh, from the bodies that they took into Gaza. And if you know anything about Israeli tradition, Israeli culture, from the days of Joseph, a person's bones are very, very important. In fact, Joseph said when he was being buried, he said, Make sure, he said, you take my bones uh, into the promised land when you enter there. And that's one of the things they did when they crossed back into the promised land all those times ago. And so it's, it was like I, I just felt, I felt that like my best friends had been attacked. Uh, anyone else felt that way? Just, just weird you know, the way God has, uh, and, and he's doing it in these last days. He's, he's knitting the body of Christ and the children of Israel uh, back together. And it's a wonderful thing to see. It's reflected in the songs we sing. You know, you think of the most popular songs we sing. You are Yahweh. That's a Hebrew name. Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, Messiah, uh, Lion of Judah. And so there's uh, all manner of reconnections that God is doing. So when something like that happens, uh, it's like I feel it personally. Anyone else felt that way? It was kind of weird, huh? Very, very strange. And so this morning I woke up praying and uh, I, I couldn't... Um, I couldn't really focus. I was saying to God, Lord, how can I preach? You know, uh, do you remember that song by the rivers of Babylon? And he says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It just felt like I was in a strange place. And singing the Lord's song, it just wasn't something that could come out of me easily. And so I thought, I can't do this. I shut my Bible and I said, right, I've got to walk the dog before coming out to church. So um, I'm just going to walk the dog. As I crossed the road into the field where I, I usually walk my dog, uh, I heard the voice of God. And it's funny, when you hear God's voice, it's like, that's it. It doesn't matter what's... Anyone else been there when, when suddenly you just... You just hear God's voice and you know it's settled, it is well, etc. And he said this, he said, preach on why Israel? Why Israel? Like, why is Israel so important? Like, you know, it, like for most people, if you've been raised and spoon-fed by the BBC and CNN and, and Al Jazeera and all the kind of uh, sort of left-wing media complex, 
then Israel is just another uh, piece of ground that is contended for over somewhere near Iraq, right? But then when you study Israel from a covenant point of view, it's a completely different situation. Israel is a covenant nation, and I want us to, to look at the history of how Israel became to be Israel and what, what it means as a result before God. So we're going to start, this is going to be a very kind of teaching modi thing um, because I feel that's the way God wants to take it. Uh, so if you have a Bible, will you turn with me to Genesis chapter 12? And we're going to look at the very outset of this covenant that is the nation of Israel. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Chapter 11 ends with the father of Abraham settling in a place called Haran. And then the story picks up in Genesis 12, 1. It says this, Now the Lord God said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Now the first thing I want you to notice in that piece of scripture is that there are three deliverances, three deliverances that Abraham has to go through. Number one is get out of your country. There's sometimes that because of a covenant connection between the land, because of altars that have been built, and I see this particularly in the continent of Africa, uh, because of covenants that were made in the land between the land and the people, that God has to deliver you from that country before he can release you into the fullness of his blessing. There are some strongholds. For instance, when I go and preach in Kenya, there are some strongholds that aren't activated in people's lives until they leave the land. They can be good Christian people in the land. Boom, the moment they're outside, those strongholds come fighting them and come looking for them. And this is like, if you don't understand that, just, just park it to one side. If you do understand it and you know, then you know. Amen. Uh, so that's the first deliverance is your country. The second deliverance that he takes Abraham through is from his relatives. Sometimes when God wants to take you somewhere, the biggest holdback to your life can be your relatives. Anyone ever notice that? Yes. Yeah. So God needs to deliver us many times from our relatives. There are spirits called familiar spirits, fam ilia spirits. And ironically, if you look through the history of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, those familiar spirits are always trying to weasel their way back into the lives of those three people. And so this was a clear-cut deliverance. Leave your country. Leave your relatives. Number three, leave your father's house. Jewish tradition teaches us that Abraham's great-grandfather was a security person at the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel was the, the seat of Babylonian witchcraft, Babylonian teaching at the time. I'm quite surprised that the European Parliament was designed on the original Tower of Babel. I mean, talk about how to grow your own destruction. But it's weird. If you look at the European Parliament and you look at the depictions of the Tower of Babel in art, it's like it's modeled on the thing. But that's their shout now. Thank God. It's, it's history for us, right? But he says, come out from your father's house. So he says to Abraham, come out from your father's house. Now look at the next verse, uh, the next piece of the verse. He says, and go to the land which I will show you. Next slide. I will make you a great nation. Well, why didn't he make him a great nation where he was? Sometimes God has to locate you in a place so that he can bring you into the blessing. Amen. Amen. The number of times I deal with people and, you know, they treat 
going to church very much like shopping. Well, I went to Asda last week because, you know, they had 40 pence off lamb chops. And, uh, you know, my wife likes lamb chops, etc. So we shopped there, etc. And then they heard that so-and-so was preaching over there. So they went to that place. And it's like, uh, it's like hang on a second. Churches aren't supermarkets. If you're in the right church, then it's a place where God can bless you. Amen. Amen. So it's really important. It's important that you know where you're planted. Because there's a DNA. Every church has a DNA. Every altar has a DNA and a purpose and a destiny. So you've got to attach yourself to the right church. You've got to attach yourself to the right altar. Right? It's really, really important. He says, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. Look at what he says, the next slide. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. In the original Hebrew, it says this, the one who curses you, I will tie them to a curse. Can you imagine being tethered by God Almighty? Are you going to get away with it? Are you going to be able to break free if God Almighty himself has tied you to a curse? So we've got to watch you. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, watch who you curse. He says, I will curse you if you curse my covenant brother, Abraham. It's amazing. We haven't got time. We go into it in great detail in Life Changers talking about covenant and what it means to be the God of Abraham and what it means to be Abraham of God because there's a covenant. That's not just, you know, like when God calls himself the God of Abraham, that's, that's not just like some, you know, ID badge like Usher or security or, you know, like uh, in, in those conferences where you've got old KPMG or, or whatever. I mean, this is, this is a proper proper, proper medicine thing. And he says, the one who curses you, I will curse. There are certain people I know because of, and we can trace it through. We're going to trace it through. I'm going to take my time. Because of their anti-Semitism, they can never be blessed. Never. Nunca. <laughs> never. It's impossible. Because there's a direct lineage. Gosh, it sure is quiet in this Jehovah Witness temple. Am I in the right church? I'm sure it said Pentecostal charismatic when I walked in the door. Huh? He says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wow. So the moment, listen, the moment, the Bible says, right? It says, so Abraham upped and left. Isn't that great? God speaks to him. The next day, the dude's off. That's proper, proper next level obedience. May you be that obedient in Jesus' mighty name. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Now, this is a partial mistake, and Lot went with him because Lot was a relative. God said, leave your relatives, and you'll find that in the life of Isaac, one of the nurses was a gift from Laban. You, you'll see it all the way through. Leave your relatives. If God says, leave your relatives, Leave your relatives. Take him seriously. Right. So he departs from Haran and he goes about. And for the sake of time, basically what he does, he goes about the land of Canaan and he plants altars. He builds altars to the Lord. The Bible says in several passages of scripture, I think it's five or six altars that Abraham uh, built on the land, the Bible says, and he sacrificed to the Lord there. And so what he was doing was he was planting altars. Those altars are still alive today. They are still recognized today. They echo through history that this land is covenant land. Let's go on again. So that's the first covenant that God makes with Abraham, and that's the covenant of the blessing. Nudge your neighbor and tell him, I'm in that covenant. Yeah, the Bible says if you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. 
And that's the promise that God made. And with blessing, I'm going to bless you. With multiplication, I'm going to multiply you. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And those who curse you, I will tie to a curse. That's why we should never judge one another. It's because we are connected to one another as the seed of Abraham, as the body of Christ. So covenant number two, that's the covenant of the blessing. That's covenant number one. Genesis 15, verse 1 to 6. Look at what the Bible says here. Are you enjoying this or are you just quite, are you, okay, okay, I'm trusting you. After, in fact, what we should do is hand out some rotten vegetables and if you don't like, just start chucking them. Is that all right? Okay, well, will you say amen occasionally? Can we practice? Oh, you're there, okay. Because it's dark, you know, yeah. Uh, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not fear, Abraham, I am a shield to you and your reward shall be very great. Next verse. Abraham said, oh Lord, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Next verse. And Abraham said, since you have no, no offspring to me, one born in my house, is my heir. Next verse. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Next verse. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. Next verse. And Abraham believed God, it says in the King James. I like that better. Because believing God is a deliberate act. Any of you ever had to believe God on purpose? Isn't it good? Especially when it comes through, it's like, yes, baby, wow, bullseye. Then he believed God. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, that is the basis of our faith. Our faith isn't in circumcision. Thank the living God. I do not want to go there. Glory to God forever. I would much rather walk by faith than by any kind of covenant of circumcision. And all the men said, Amen. Amen. Praise Jesus forever. Glory to God. Fully intact. Uh, then (laughs) Then he believed... In the Lord, and it was reckoned. Now, you see, here's, here's the basis of faith. When you study uh, Paul's relationship with God and how he unpacks and unfolds the revelation of righteousness by faith, this is a keynote scripture because this came before circumcision. So, the Bible, our, our righteousness is by faith because it came before circumcision. So Abraham was righteous by faith before he was righteous by circumcision. Really important to understand if you're talking covenants. Remember, this is a book of covenants. And we are so Gentilized often that we don't recognize and understand covenants. Where blood is shed is very, very important. So this is the covenant of the seed. God said, I'm going to bless you. One from your own loins is going to be born and your descendants are going to be greater than the stars of heaven, the Bible says. And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. So that's the covenant of the seed. We are the seed of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham by faith. There are some who are the seed of uh, of Abraham by direct genetic connection. And this is what we're going to go in. We're going to look in forensically at that covenant connection by the, uh, the genetic lineage. Because uh, you may have heard the word Jews, right? The word Jew comes from the word Judah. Judah was a son of Jacob. Jacob was a son of Isaac. Isaac was a son of Abraham. So there's a direct genetic lineage where the blessing follows genetic descendants and goes all the way through up until the Jews of this moment. Isn't that amazing? In fact, I've been doing some uh, genealogy stuff and I I might be Jewish. (laughs) How about that? Praise God, they're still looking into it, but yeah. Isn't that so cool? 
Praise God. Yes. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 7. This is a third covenant that we're looking at today. So we've looked at the covenant of the blessing. We've looked at the covenant of the seed. One from your own loins shall come forth. Now, Genesis 15, verse 7 to 21 is the covenant of the land. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur of the Chaldeans is where Babylon was, and that's where the Tower of Babel was. And he says, to give you, I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. Next verse. He said, oh Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? God said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer. Uh, now, how many of you have, have got a background in a land or a nation that is still practicing covenants today? Just raise your hand. Right, okay. Co this is a, you see, because we're in the West, because we are Gentilized, we don't understand what's going on there. When God said to Abraham, bring me a heifer, that would be like God saying uh, to somebody, I don't know, some young kid. Uh, in fact, this happened. I was in a Kim Clement meeting over in America once, and he said, he said, the Lord shows me, he said, the next president of the United States is here, and you're an eight-year-old boy, and he named him. And the little guy, like, there was a lot of security around and everything like that. But there's, I mean, there's like a guy who's had hands laid on him by one of the greatest prophets. He's like an Isaiah to America. And he's, he's been prophesied that he's, he's, he's going to be a president of the U.S., a Latino boy. How cool is that? And he named him, and the kid came forward. And I saw which one it was, because, like, he said, oh, right, oh, what, how, this is how we're going to do it, because of prophetic covering. Uh, every child... Eight years old and under, come forward like that. So there was like a hundred kids or so. Dude, you could spot this dude a mile away. The glory of God on his life at the age of eight. Imagine. Uh, a lot of people don't realize America is a covenant nation. They don't realize it. You study American history, it was a righteous revolution. That's like, it's, it, it was led by pastors and teachers and bishops fascinating history, covenant history of America. We might, we might teach you, because there's only two covenant nations on earth. Israel is one, and that was God's covenant with man. America's number two, that's man's covenant with God. So if you hate Israel and you hate America, you've got a serious problem, dude. Deliverance is available for you. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Are you there? Amen. Okay. So, Abraham, you take, now get this, right? Abraham is, is in his mid-80s his mid when this is happening. And he doesn't have a problem with being told you're going to have a kid. The Bible says, and he believed God, and it was reckoned to him as, as righteousness. When it came to the land, he said, dude, this is the equivalent now. This is the equivalent of somebody saying, thus says the Lord, Right? You're going to be a president of the United States. And uh, the, 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 the kid says, well, how do I know? Uh, bring me a Supreme Court judge. We are going to write it in statute today. Thus says the Lord God Almighty, thou shalt be, at, and, and, and swear him by Almighty God, by the Constitution of the United States, that this kid is going to be a, a, a president of the U.S. This is how big... This thing is. Abraham says, how do I know I'm going to inherit the land? God says, bring me a heifer. Strongest form of agreement that exists in humanity. Blood covenant. Blood covenant. God says, bring me a heifer. That's the equivalent of us saying, bring me a Supreme Court judge. Don't just get me a lawyer. Don't just get me a notary public. Bring me the top chief justice in the land. And I'll put my hand on the Bible and I'll swear in front of him. Thus says the Lord God Almighty. That's how strong it is. Powerful thing. And it's about the land. He didn't have trouble believing 
he didn't have trouble believing that he would have kids supernaturally. But when it came to the land, my goodness me, there's a contention. Amen. Amen. So it's really important that we understand this. God says to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, because that back then was the strongest form of agreement that existed. If you broke covenant, this kind of covenant, the people that you made covenant with were justified in slaughtering your descendants to the seventh generation. Justified. They could bring that covenant to a court of law, to a tribunal or whatever, and they could say, uh, I'm sorry, but so-and-so breached his covenant. And the judge would say, you killed how many? Yeah, 200 of his people. Oh, oh well, okay, you're justified. Because he broke covenant. You, you talk, huh? You go to uh, nations like Albania, blood feuds. Have you ever heard the word vendetta? That's what it's about. It's about covenantal breaches, right? Next verse after this, verse nine, uh, 10. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. Now remember what this is about. Nudge your neighbor and tell him this is about the land. Right, next verse. The birds of prey came down, and Abraham drove them away. Next verse. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Next verse. God said to Abraham, know that for certain your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. So these are conditions of the covenant. They will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. Next verse. But I will also judge the nation whom they serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. Next verse. As for you, you shall go to your fathers, and you will be buried at a good old age. Next verse. Then in the fourth generation they will return there, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Next verse. It came about, look at this, when the sun had set, that it was very dark, and there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. This is covenant. This is God himself appearing in a visible form and walking up and down on blood and swearing to Abraham that to you and to your seed, I am going to give this land. Blood covenant. Look at it. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the great river of Egypt as far as the great river, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the, the Euphrates River. And then he names off the, the nations that he's going to dispossess as a result of his covenant with the land. Now, in Genesis 25, verse number 22, Genesis 25, verse 22, we see this covenant passing through from Isaac, the seed of, of Abraham, to Jacob. Genesis 25, verse number 22 to 26. This is Rebecca's request. Anyone know my wife's ministry? How, how does Rebecca's request go? Right. It's drilled in, isn't it? It's drilled in. The children struggled together, and she said, if it is so, then why am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Look at what God says. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Amazing. It's one of the, one of the very few instances where the older wasn't the firstborn. Amazing, isn't it? And the younger, sorry, the older that he's talking about is Esau, and the younger that he's talking about is who? Jacob. Right, we're getting there. We are exactly on time. Genesis 32, verse 26. Genesis 32, 26. Look at what he says here. This is Jacob now. In his years, he's grown up, he's been ripped off, he's been you know, involved in all kinds of stuff, and his name is catching up with him. You know, when, when we hear the word Jacob, we don't hear uh, 
how would you call it, shifty, uh, the equivalent numerically in Nigeria would be if you named your child 419. <laughs> Can you imagine that every time they hear their name, imagine. Uh, 419, put the kettle on, please. 419, do your homework. 419, I mean, can you imagine? A 419 is advanced fee fraud. Yeah. Uh, it used to be a classic habit of certain nations, which will remain nameless. But um, that's, that, was, that was the history of the thing. But that's the equivalent of calling your child 419. So now Jacob is wrestling with his identity. And he's wrestling with God. And God, by his angel, is fighting him and he's not letting him go. And he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. So Jacob's not letting this angel go. He says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And then the angel says this to him. Next verse. He says, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Next verse. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but what? Israel. Israel. Do you remember the title of my message? Why Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and what? Have prevailed. Amen. So there's something about the inherent nature of anyone that is Israel to prevail. Amen. 2,000 years of prevailing. Amen. You can see, you can see a nation like Israel, the Hebrew language. Uh, I, can find, I can find some second-generation Ghanaians. I can speak more Chui than they can. <laughs> second-generation Kenyans. I can speak more Swahili. Yeah, second-generation uh, Igbos. I can find. I can find them. I can speak more Igbo than them. Yeah. That's how fast languages die when you're outside of a nation or outside of a heritage. Or as, look at Hebrew. 2,000 years without a homeland. 2,000 years, but the altars, Abraham's altars, are still calling. In the days of the League of Nations, when uh, they were wondering what to do with this place called British-mandated Palestine, after World War I, after the Ottoman Empire was conquered and chopped up, and they're wondering what to do with this, this parcel of land, British-mandated uh, Palestine, and they're, looking, they're saying, well, it should be the Jewish uh, homeland. Sir so Arthur Balfour promised the, the people of Israel that it would be, once again, their Jewish homeland. And there was this thing called the Balfour Betrayal that basically the British government swiped it aside, and that's the beginning of the end of the British Empire. The moment they said, like, this is how powerful this thing is. God walked in blood. Bring me a heifer. We just read it. God himself walked in blood to make sure that this covenant is, an, is a lasting covenant as long as the earth remains. And so there's a ticking countdown clock that is active in the lives of God's people. To the extent that when the British government, when the, the British Empire, at the height of empire, is deciding what to do, and they said, well, the Jewish people need a homeland, uh, so let's put them in Uganda. Did you know that? It was an original plan. Because they thought if we, put, if we allow the Jewish people to return to their home, all the Arab nations are going to rise up. So they chose Uganda. That was one of their plans. Pitched. Yeah. And the Jewish people said, no. This is, this is our homeland. This is the land of milk and honey. This is our covenant land. And when you go there, those of you that have been to it, you understand, right? Yeah. You, you feel it. It's in the air. God is there. And he's got great taste, man. Je uh, Jesus living in Galilee, one of the most beautiful places on earth. May you go there in Jesus' name. Amen. And listen, don't, don't be put off by this nonsense that they've been doing. Uh, that, thing, that thing, God is on it. Watch how the Lord is, is going to uh, come and avenge. We've been praying for the arrow of vengeance. Yes. And in Jesus' mighty name, it will hit the bullseye. Amen. Now, here's the problem. You remember? You remember the original covenant, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will tie to a curse. Right. Now, 
I want you to see God's timing on this, right? Because in our mind, it happened thousands of years ago. 2 Peter 3 and verse number 8. 2 Peter 3, 8. I want you to see how God sees this. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. Right? Now, this is 2,000 years before Christ that God is walking in blood. So in God's mind, it's four days ago. Hello. Do you understand? Like, there's certain people in certain parts of the world right now that have a serious issue. Because four days ago, God walked in blood and gave the people the land. So it's as fresh in God's mind, in God's understanding, as though it happened four days ago. But you know what? I was just thinking about this as well. Do you know the way it works? God's timing works with us. I love this. Uh, you may have missed it yesterday. You may have sinned against the Lord yesterday. Called somebody a silly so-and-so or had a go at somebody, mistreated somebody, right? Uh, but in God's understanding, that was a thousand years ago. Look what he says. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is what? Like a day. So yesterday, right, how can the devil condemn you? Oh, I had a ruck with my husband. Yes, I called him this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. I feel guilty. I feel condemned. And God says, okay, you've laid it before me. You've repented of your sin. So in my mind, it's like it happened a thousand years ago. What are you worrying about? It's under the blood. It's dealt with. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, God... God can bend things in his favor because he's God, Amen. right? You read, you read when, when Herod had James killed. Do you remember that scripture, right? And then they prayed and Peter got released. But then a few moments later, down the, in that same uh, uh, chapter in the book of Acts, right? Herod is standing before, in fact, we stood there in Caesarea. When we last went to Israel, we stood in the big atrium in Caesarea where this actually happened. And you can stand in Herod's seat where he was standing and making this great speech. And the Bible says, and the people were calling out, the voice of a God and not a man. And the angel of the Lord is standing there waiting for instruction. And suddenly God said, yeah, go on. And the Bible says, next verse, the angel of the Lord struck him. Boom. And he turned to worms and died. The Bible didn't say that he died and then turned to worms. I mean, this guy is turning to, like horror, uh, Halloween, Friday the 13th, uh, Chuck E. Cheese, or whatever his name was, uh, like bad boy horror film stuff where this guy is turning to worms as he's standing up and died boom hey what a way to go but look at what the scripture says was the reason next verse uh, oh go back sorry go back two verses let's see if this there on an appointed date yeah uh, carry on, next verse. Next verse. And immediately, look at this. The end, now, this is, this is how God bends things, right? There's certain, you tick God off. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like the guy poking a bear with a stick. You keep poking the bear, right? The bear will look at, it'll ignore you for a while. You keep poking the thing. One day, that bear is coming at you full force and you're not going to expect it. Because it says, the angel of the Lord struck him. What was the reason? Because he did not give God the glory. How many football players have you seen? 80,000 seat stadium, scoring goals, boom, and they're not giving God the glory. Everyone's thinking, oh man, that was godlike. oh Whatever, they're not giving God the glory, right? But there's certain things when the balance of judgment, 
the whole thing slides down on top of you. And this is part of the problem with those people who have cursed Israel with their deeds yesterday. Israel is a covenant nation. God's people, and we've traced it right through. We've traced it. You see, when we say Israel, we're thinking nation. When God hears Israel, he's thinking my covenant brother's grandchildren. Touch them, you are dead. My covenant brother's grandchildren. That's a, that's a serious thing. It's a very, very serious thing. I'm praying right now for God's covenant people. I'll be honest with you. If, if, if you hate Israel, you don't belong in this church. You don't belong here. It's all right if you don't understand and you're willing to learn. That's a different matter. But we interpret everything in the light of God's word. I'm sure there's anti-Semitic churches in London. I'm sure. CNN fed, BBC fed, Al Jazeera fed. Go and eat your food. Because there's something about God's people. There's something about that nation. Those of you that have been there, you know it. You absolutely know it. Doesn't mean everything they do is good and right. Everything we do isn't good and right. But there's something about how God watches over them. And he's proved it through history time and time again. Let's stand to pray right now. Jacob, who became Israel, had a son called Judah. And Judah is where we get the name Jew from. Because they are of the tribe of Judah. And they are God's covenant brother's grandchildren. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray that, Lord God, you will restore, that you will revive, that you will protect. Whatever went wrong in the intelligence community, Father, whatever, whatever gaps and mistakes allowed that disaster to happen. Father, we pray, Lord God, for the people. Let peace be upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. Let healing and restoration be upon them, Lord God. Father, we thank you for that bloodline. Lord, your word said, look down and see the dust of the earth. Father, that's the dust-born sea. And you said, look up and see the stars of heaven. That's the heaven-born sea. We are both the seed of Abraham. And your word says that it's not us that supports the root. It's the root that supports us. And in Jesus' mighty name, Lord God, we thank you for that support in the realm of the spirit. We thank you for that covenant that resounds even today. We are partakers of it, Father. We thank you, Lord that we are the blessed seed of Abraham. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to today's message. We hope it ministers to you and blesses you throughout the week and further along. Have a blessed week and God bless.